I assume you're all here to learn about my journey with home automation and what I think about the future. If not, there are other rooms available. I've uh, spent 30 years developing software, uh, most of it just hacking around from being given a computer at four, sold my first computer program at eight, and the rest became a long history. I've lived a great life where people have paid me to do what I love, and I love to share what I've learned with others. So I spend most of my days hacking on computers and then go home and spend my days hacking on computers too. All my opinions are my own. Um, you'll see lots of logos for other companies. I don't represent any of those. This is all stuff I've done in my personal time. And I just wanted to show you what is now a 12-year journey in home automation. I spent a lot of money and cried a lot of tears, so hopefully you don't have to. Uh, you might have seen, oh, sorry, why are you here? Uh, hopefully you'll fall into one of these buckets. Uh, you either saw my first talk that I did four years ago and want to know where I'm up to, definitely do that. Uh, you might want to know how you get started with home automation and where to begin or how to think about it. We'll get enough to get you going, but we're not going to go into too much detail in any particular area, but yes. You might have dabbled already with some home automation and you want some ideas about what else you could do. We've got a lot of whistle stops. Uh, yeah, 78 slides. So we're going to go at some pace through some of the things and uh, I'll be around at the end if you want anything in specific you want to go into more detail about. You might also be wondering if now is the right time to automate your home. You might have looked at the prices, light switches or bulbs, and they're like 50 pounds each, and just counting the, oh my goodness me, it gets expensive very quickly. So at what point do you buy an electric car? What point do you automate your house? It's a good question, and hopefully I'll give you some idea about whether you think it might be worth it. So this is a lead on from what I talked about when I automated my old house the first time. And I've got a new house, and I've tried automating it again. And I've got a whole new set of problems, and I fixed an old, uh, all of my old ones. So if you want to know where I was, I'm not going to cover too much on it, but there it is. So why me? Why, why am I the person standing up in front of you, not someone from Google Home or Amazon talking about Alexa or whatever? Well, this is what I did with my old house. Uh, I had motion sensors. They would control the lights. They were quite nice. You just wandered into the bathroom. And you didn't need to look for a switch. Uh, I'd have a uh, hive running my central heating. Uh, I had an old hot water cylinder, and it would make sure that I had hot water whenever I needed it, and tried to make sure that I uh, wasn't paying for hot water when I didn't. I had a ring doorbell, which would... Uh, we started with it with security, but really it's just ways of talking to delivery drivers. Um, and a pipe of video security monitor. I sold my house, and it was very useful to sit there and watch my house for me and just tell me if anyone came in, because no one should. Uh, nest smoke alarms, mostly peace of mind stuff, and I had a hodgepodge of all sorts of stuff in my living room, and so everything talked infrared, so I had a Logitech Harmony Hub that would communicate and do all of those things. It just reads uh, infrared codes, and you can just replay them. Uh, Yale Connexus, so I had my front door. I actually had two front doors. <laughs> I put a proper front door on my inside as of my porch. That meant I could leave my outside porch and just let delivery drivers in. And I didn't have to let them into my actual house, and I didn't need to leave my expensive TV on the road. Uh, I had, uh, smart things was what I picked to glue everything together. So it talks Z-Wave, it talks all sorts of things, and I just used it as the hub of hubs. And uh, Sonos was my speaker system of choice. I quite like them. Um, they just get very expensive very quickly, and you want to put them everywhere. Uh, I tried uh, Alexa, is what uh, I was using for my voice assistant, and uh, you know me is a cloud app that just glues stuff together. Uh, and a genie, so one of the things that you work out very quickly is when I'm not home, how do I power cycle my house? <laughs> and so, and a genie I used as, because uh, it, it runs on a completely separate frequency to everything else, I can use that as out of band and I can reboot my phone from a, my house from a smartphone. It can't do anything else other than turn all my hubs on and off, but it's really useful if something's gone wrong and something's crashed. Um, yeah, and they're the protocols I'm using. I ended up with 11 apps. So anyone who had to be me and manage my house, um, I found very quickly that me, my wife, my kids, it was me who was very much running my house. 
Uh, we'll get into that later, because there was a storm yesterday, and that was interesting. Uh, now, uh, my new house has decided to go away from bulbs and hive, and I've gone to smart switches, plug sockets, heating controls. These are all actually physical wired things. Uh, yeah, running mains electricity. That's good fun. Um, I've gone with Honeywell, and I've taken all of my thermostats off on my radiators, so they're no longer TRVs, they're smart TRVs. So every radiator in my house knows what temperature it is. And I use wireless thermostats for the rooms that have got underfloor heating in the floor that, uh, wooden floor areas. Uh, Govi light strips, it's the only ones I've found that have a, a Wi-Fi uh, API, so kids love them. Uh, again, I, I stuck with Ring. I thought Ring was useful, and I've moved over to Hikvision, mainly because Piper decided they didn't like being a company anymore. At least that's why I, they, they just literally just stopped overnight. So you can't even buy Pipers anymore, let alone even use them. So I went for something a bit, with a bit more longevity. Uh, Hikvision seems to be quite the standard. I've got a garage door that you can open and close, and so I've hot-wired that with Digigate, because it can push it for me. Uh, I've now got a smart washing machine that can talk to my dryer. <laughs> I'll explain more about that later. <laughs> um, and again, Nest, uh, they're the only people that really do smoke alarms. Um, and I kept the doors and speakers, because I spent a lot of money on them. <laughs> and um, I did some other stuff. I've now got it down to two apps, and I'll explain how and why. And if you want to follow the journey I've done, then stick around. So. Let's say you want to start. Where do you start? And it's always with this question. Do not go out and just buy whatever you want and plug it. I mean, feel free, but almost certainly you'll end buying up something you don't need or don't want, and it's just a flashy little thing. I mean, I bought um, 10, 12 different like Raspberry Pis and things like that, and they've all been good toys. But this is going to have to fit into your life. So really think about what do you want from your system? So if we break this down, it's the what problem are you solving? Because you can already turn the lights on and off, right? Is it because you're lazy? Well, think about how you do things today. And then it's quite simple. Just think about how you would like to do them tomorrow. You do also have to think about what, uh, how other people are going to do it as well. So for example, if the only way you can turn the lights on in the bathroom is by walking in your motion sensor working, if your network goes down and it's 2 o'clock in the morning, and in my case, my partner can't see where she's going. I very quickly am not asleep anymore. And so I have to think very carefully about the problems I'm wanting to gain out of this in order to get all of the good stuff. Because code is not an asset, it's a liability. So the thing you have to maintain, you have to run in these things, actually can be quite painful. So make sure you know what you're doing and why you're doing it. Because when you get up at 2 o'clock in the morning, it'll remind you why you're up at 2 o'clock in the morning and why well, that's OK. So one of the biggest ones, and I've, uh, is it was a bigger impact for us, um, environment and cost saving, which come hand in hand, because we now have our lights on less. In fact, uh, I was able to model both cases of when I had switches and when I put sensors in. Putting sensors in reduced my lights being on by 60%. It just means that I now know when a cupboard has been left open or when a door uh, is open and uh, a bathroom light has been left on. I have younger kids. I've got teenagers now. Teenagers don't sit and look at a house full of light. I've become my dad going, it's Blackpool Illuminations in here. <laughs> and uh, it becomes a system that self-regulates. What, um, we'll talk about heating later, but that's, uh, I've, I've saved a lot of money. Don't know whether I've actually saved more than it's cost me. But I know I've saved more money out of energy. So I feel like good on saving the planet, but giving that money to people who produce products. Um, security and peace of mind. So CCTV is useful of, has anyone actually, you hear a noise downstairs. I know no one's downstairs, because my senses would have gone off. And at a look of an app, I can see whether anyone's actually downstairs. And so I go straight back to sleep, usually. Um, also, why is this thing on? Why is this thing doing this? Uh, don't know if you're like me, but uh, when I, I'm quite sensitive to noise at night, and I can hear the rumble of a motor. So I know when my hot water or my central heating is running, because I can hear the whir of the motor. And at 4 o'clock in the morning, my brain goes, something's costing you money, and you don't know why. <laughs> So it helps me. I, I pick it up and I go, oh, right, OK, that thermostat is too low. B 
because it's triggered the heating because we can see where the call for heat has come from. Or why is my hot water running for six hours to give me two, sh two baths? Wait a second, why am I having two baths? But that's a different problem. Uh, yeah, uh, I have four girls in my house. Uh, long. Uh, yeah. Uh, ease of use. <laughs> I, I have had to work out how easy I want my house to be. <laughs> At what point level do I want to wander in and have to explain to the mother-in-law how to use the fridge? Why is it beeping at me? It's closed. Well, it sort of is, but you left the drawer inside of it open, which means that the frost... Oh, never mind, I'll fix it. And uh, uh, actually, a lot of what I've done, especially recently, like even as recently as this weekend, has been just for fun. I'm just intrigued, I want to play with this stuff. So yeah, get me get out of PCB and get out of multimeter. I just want to go off and experiment with something and play with it for no other reason than just geeky curiosity that I've had since I was so young and remains to this day. Oh, also, my wife's a maker, and so am I. We like making stuff. There's always stuff going on. You'll never come to our house and there isn't either a Lego puzzle or a bit of uh, uh, a jigsaw somewhere, or there's a pile of knitting definitely everywhere you can sit. So it, it scratches that itch of being able to make a thing and say, hey, I've done this. So once you've done this, I regret not doing this the first time around, so get your backbone in, in order. First off, you need a reasonably reliable internet connection, and, or at least you need to know when your internet connection isn't reliable. The amount of time you'll chase your tail because you've had some packet loss, it's worth knowing that you're getting packet loss or your latency has gone up. They're really simple monitors. You can sit running on a Pi, or if you've got a router you can control, most of them have got firmwares that you can update to tell you this sort of stuff. You're going to want to know, is it my physical network, or is it my wireless network before you bother trying to solve any other problems with IoT? If it boils down to one of these categories, you will lose days of time trying to work out through the ring app as to why is it not uploading my thing to my thing in my place? Is it not connecting? So you need to make sure you've got a reasonable amount of monitoring around your network that just tells you, yes, it's all okay, and if it's not, which bit isn't? Doesn't take much, but you do have to be aware you especially have to be aware of congestion. So if you live in, a, in the suburbia, then hopefully your uh, Wi-Fi um, and a spectrum isn't that dense. But the denser you make that Wi-Fi spectrum, uh, the more people that have got microwaves around you, the harder a time things are going to happen, especially if someone in the flat next to you is microwaving their meal when you're not expecting them to. And then you're wondering why my sensors aren't triggering. There's Loads of ways of figuring that out, but know whether that is your problem or not. Uh, walls as well. I wouldn't presume that a new build has walls that are compatible with radio frequencies because they really don't care. I've got friends in new builds that have struggled getting a 5G signal through two walls. And so just know what environment you've got. Yeah, walls, saturation. They're terrible. If you could do away with, if you could have open plan living, that's wonderful. Except you then have to live with everyone in the same space, so it's terrible. So I don't suggest easy of those. But the interference is what will kill you every single time. So watch out for the interference. So once you're confident you've got a network in place, both a physical one that can get out to the internet and a wireless one that you can tr rely on, remember that you're going to be learning a lot, and you will reach the peak of mountain stupid very, very quickly. And some of the stuff that you will play with, especially if you go down the path that I have, will kill you. Um, my cousin woke up in the bath <laughs> after changing a light bulb, uh, all because someone had put a fuse in upside down and on looked like off, and when they were testing, it didn't come up. So don't go above your confidence level, but remember your confidence level is affected by this graph. So the quicker, you, the quicker you can get over the peak of Mount Stupid and have the knowledge about what's going on and get yourself into the valley of despair where you feel like you're being dangerous, the better. If you're not feeling dangerous, you probably are. And yeah, anytime I have to unscrew a wall panel, I am petrified I'm about to kill myself or someone else. 
And if you can, get a professional to do it. If not, at least get them to come and sign it off. I've had uh, my usual pattern is when I'm playing with, with wall sockets uh, for plugs or light switches, I'll get a professional electrician to come around and do the first three and I'll watch. I'll do the next three and he'll watch or she'll watch. And uh, finally, I'll feel confident, um, I'll take the panels off and if I feel comfortable, I recognize the wiring and I know exactly what I'm doing, I'll do it. And I'll get them to come back and check. If I take it off and in some multi-way switching, um, some houses have like five, six way switching, they, they look a mess and you just, learn to very quickly screw that panel back on and I'll pay someone not to help. Nothing is worth dying over. So after underscoring that and anything you do, if you decide to do anything based on this, it's not because of my advice, please. <laughs> I'm not qualified to instruct on this. This is all just what I've learned. So you have to choose when it comes to your electrics for lighting. Do you want to go down the switches or the sockets? Um, uh, switches and sockets or bulbs and plugs. But what I mean by that is either you're going to replace the things in the wall that carry the voltage and its main voltage, and they are smart and they have little chips in them that talk Z-Wave or whatever protocol, or do you want to just change the bulb? I mean, the bulb that takes no wiring, but you're basically ignoring the switch then, you're leaving the switch on permanently, and uh, so everything is permanently powered, and then there's a computer and it decides, do I actually do something? Do I generate light or do I actually let the power through? I initially went for the latter, and I'm, I'm now doing the former. Uh, know that if you do the former, you're playing with 220 to 240 volts all the time, and it's, uh, if it's lighting, it's usually six to 10 amps, which is very painful and can kill, uh, or 16 to 32 amps on a ring, and that certainly will kill. Uh, if nothing else, you'll lose a finger, maybe a hand. Um, I put this in because I literally created an electric chair. I've got a fuse box that is on the wall above a door, so you have to stand on the chair to get to it. And uh, unfortunately, uh, due to the way that the old, because it's an old house, my house was built in 1905, um, the way that their circuit breakers, I wasn't as familiar as I should have been, and uh, my Sparky told me, you don't know that's live because you won't get the, it's not got an RCD on it, so you just won't know, because it's got no uh, earth detection. So the first question he taught me is, is it live? Are you sure it's live? Are you sure it's not? How sure are you not? And so he gave me these tools uh, to stop me creating what was effectively an actual chair. So if you're going to play, get these three. You want a clamp meter, that's just going to tell you how many amps are going through whatever you clamp it around. It's a non-contact um, uh, method of reading, um, uses Hall effect to read how much uh, ampage is going through a wire. If it's not zero, or close to zero, don't touch it. Uh, the contact volt tester is the thing that looks like a pen. It screams at you. <laughs> If that flashes and screams, don't touch it. And the plug. Um, so if you need to change a wall socket, you plug that in, and it screams at you too. And if you turn the right circuit off on your fuse board, it stops screaming at you, because there's no power anymore. So, uh, and when you turn it back on, it will also do an earth loop check and do five other things. But they generally check that I'm not going to burn my house down before I get my uh, uh, electrician to come around and verify. So there is, I, I, I've become basically a heating engineer, not by choice, but by necessity, because it's a whole different, it's like picking up a whole new language. So things that might seem, they all seem obvious once you know about it, and actually heat engineering is very simple mechanical engineering. So flow of return, think of that as flow is hot and return is cold. And if it's not cold on the way back, why did you send it? Because it's definitely lost some heat in, in its movement. Uh, zone, so uh, that's a heating loop. So if you've got a combi boiler, you'll probably only have one zone. But if you have a upstairs and a downstairs, and you can uh, send heat upstairs so, or downstairs or both, then you've got two zones. And zones are controlled by two port valves. They're called two port valves because they have two holes. <laughs> and uh, uh, they take a, uh, when you power them, it closes the, um, the valve and then passes the power to whatever you plug it into next. 
which is usually a pump. So you, just by powering the valve means that you will always power the pump. And then usually the pump is uh, wired into whatever your heat source is, like a boiler, which means that you're never going to be boiling unless there's something to pump. And you're never going to be pumping against a closed valve, because if you lose power to the valve, you'll uh, lose pumping. Well, that's not quite true, because pumps have overrun. So sometimes you need a bypass in place. And a bypass, a little bit like a heart bypass, is a, a, a method by which you will short circuit the heating loop in order that if you're still pumping against a closed valve, the pressure is somewhere to go, otherwise bad things happen. Unvented system. Uh, uh, in the UK, it used to, the most common system used to be an open un, uh, vented, uh, vented system, so you'd have a hot water tank and a cold water tank, and you'd use gravity pressure. The unvented system is a pressurized system where the hot water uh, is maintained at the same pressure as what comes out of the tap, so it can mix them. It's as simple as that, but you have a bomb in your house. It's, yeah. I, I, I went and learned a lot about that, got very scared, and realized it's OK. Uh, blenders and mixers are just a way of taking two heat sources of different temperatures and getting out. So uh, you, you'll hear about that if you have underfloor sy systems, mostly. Uh, radiator balancing. Uh, it turned out to be a thing, because I managed to just completely screw up every radiator in my house by changing one. So if you imagine that, like electricity, water and pressure will go over the, close, the shortest loop it can. So if you open the valve on a three radiator system fully, it will just go over that first radiator. You have to close the valve to encourage the pressure to reach the second and third. Radiator balancing is a process of doing that. If you ever happen to have a cold radiator and it's not because, and you've bled it so it's got no air in, it's probably balancing. Who knew? Uh, heat demand and heat supply, you need to know where your heat's coming from, and more importantly for saving money, what's calling for heat. So if uh, your 14-year-old daughter has decided she likes her room in the, like a sauna, then your boiler's going to be running a lot, and you might not want it to be set to 35 degrees Celsius. Uh, there are two different systems. I'm not going to run through them, but you've either got a combi system that is just as I've described, or you've got what is an S-plan system, which basically means you've got valves and electrics control lots of things. I've left them in the slides just so you can refer to them, but effectively, if you've got a zone system, if you've got a hot water tank, you're probably going to be S-plan. If you've got a combi, you'll be the first. So once you've done all of this, you actually can get on with it and actually start doing things. So let's go through the smart devices. The first bit is gathering data. Most of the smart devices, the IoT stuff, is based off things that have happened, or things that are going to happen, or thing, uh, a notification of a thing that's not as it should be. Uh, temperature's too high, too low, but, so I need to gather temperature. So the sorts of sensors that are worth looking into are motion and presence. Basically, is, any, is someone somewhere? So there are present sensors here would be saying there's someone here. Is someone in the bathroom? Uh, ambient light is measured in lumens, so how much light is already in the bathroom? Uh, this, just gathering the amount of light that was already in the bathroom, rather than always turning it on if I saw someone, I reduced by about 65, 70% the amount of times that I turned bathroom lights on, because it didn't need to. Um, you can also go, for, if I, uh, the last talk talked about me trying TensorFlow, which would take all of the sensor data and then work out should I turn the light on or not, and then use the action of a human to correct it, to correct it, and that did not work out well. I thought it would, but it doesn't. It turns out machine learning isn't as quick as we're learning. Um, temperature and humidity, um, generally speaking, so extractor fans running in bathrooms, they only really to run when you uh, are in the shower for other reasons, uh, but uh, work out when you want to extract a fan, and ours now run far less, but so, um, after a bath, they run for much longer, because there's more humidity in the air. Uh, open and closed doors, windows. Have I locked all the doors? Have I shut all the windows? It's not a great thing to wonder while you're in a campsite, and so it helps you. Uh, location. Um, uh, Where's my dog? Um, has everyone left the house and the lights are still on? Uh, CCTV, everything we covered before. Uh, also, it's useful for computer vision. 
So OpenCV gives you very easy access to do all sorts of really cool things, like can I see if the gates are open? Has a thing been left in a certain place? Does it lo normally looks like X, is it Y? And then start smart device, as we start putting smart devices everywhere, so door locks, dishwashers, et cetera, if they're smart, we want to get the data out of them. So can I get the state from them? Uh, there's also external data sources, weather, sunset, sunrise. That's very useful for knowing, has this, is it, if the sun's down, I probably want to put a floodlight on if someone's in the backyard, for example. And if it's 3 o'clock in the morning and someone's in the backyard, I probably want to do something different. Uh, lighting, you get the choice between smart bulbs and LED strips, or you're going for dimmable light switches and relays. One thing to note is you can't change the color if all you can do is vary the voltage. If all I can do is uh, vary the voltage and the current that I'm passing through to my smart devices, which is all a wall switch can do. It can't do anything funky. So uh, whereas if you've got a bulb, it's whatever API you're talking about. You've got a rich protocol that you're telling it to go on and off so you can actually pass more information to it. So there's no way to do color, is really what that boils down to. Um, and uh, if you're running very large rings, um, quite often these devices are having, you can't cope with 800 watts running through them. Most are limited to 300 watts, 200 watts. So maybe a smart relay that doesn't do dimmable but can do on and off. So for things like floodlights in the backyard that are 350 watts, they're really quite helpful. Uh, control planes to be aware of is Wi-Fi, uh, Bluetooth, and DMX. So DMX is uh, stage lighting. Um, if you've ever wondered how they do all the light controls on TV shows or at theaters, it's all running DMX. Usually DMX uh, 512. Uh, it's an interesting protocol, but every time I've gone there, the equipment gets so expensive. It's cool, but do I really need a class four laser in my living room? Yeah, yeah, I do. <laughs> um, uh, uh, for heating, you're wanting uh, data, so thermostats, your smart TV, TRVs, so your, all your smart TRV is doing is got a little pin and it'll drill in and out. So just like your, um, your uh, TRV that's done, we'll do that based on a thermostat that's one to five. Uh, a smart TRV actually does it against the temperature and we will actually report the temperature as well somewhere else. So we can vary each room remotely. And a smart switch or a relay is very similar to the relay I was just talking about, uh, but this one has got, just got extra buttons for things like boost. I want more hot water now, it's quite useful. It means that uh, if you can, make it so that there's physical buttons to do anything that you would do digitally. Otherwise, if it needs your app on your phone to log in and do a thing, it's quite painful. Here I can tell anyone, if it, it's got written on top of mine, if it's cold, push this button and it makes it warm. There we go. So the thing that I find really annoying, um, this isn't my room, but this is not far off what a, um, a plant room or a boiler room would look like if you've got hot water valves, etc. cetera. Um, I, telling whether the valve is open or not, whether the pump is running or not, uh, each of these pipes, uh, the air temperature is really easy and really common, but Strapping one of those to the pipes just doesn't work. And getting a pipe contact temperature is really hard. The boil I actually just want to know how much my boiler's costing me. I can't work out how much gas it's taking. That's a really hard thing. You need a commercial valve and they cost 4,000 pounds. And it's probably not worth me spending 4,000 pounds to know that I'm spending an extra 30 quid a month than I need to. And also, 16 amp uh, power consumption is really hard because I've got an immersion heater in the bottom of my hot water to get instant power or in case the gas isn't working or the boiler breaks down. That's all brilliant, but at the very low voltage, uh, low voltage I can work out power. And my plug sockets that are 13 amps, they'll all tell me how much it's consuming. And I can do contact sensors on the um, um, hole sensor, sorry, on the uh, inbound energy feed, but it needs to be pulling in 200, 300 amps for it to register. 16 amps, which is quite a lot of stuff that pull. So your electric oven will pull around 16 to 24 amps. And being able to work out how much it costs me in energy to make that meal is not an easy thing to answer right now. So yeah, this is where I'm up to.
Uh, otherwise, uh, in about a month, I'll probably have better answers for this slide. So if you're down this path, feel free to give me a shout, and I'll tell you where I got to. Watch out for privacy. In case anyone didn't see uh, the news, uh, someone just got fined £100,000 for their ring doorbell picking up their neighbour who was walking up and down. Um, uh, she was uh, perturbed by effectively being monitored by her neighbour and the bitter relationships between them. And he hadn't used uh, the neighbouring uh, fault, had a ring doorbell, but hadn't put exclusion zones. So as she walked in and out outside of her house, he was getting notified of when she was there and she was feeling monitored. And quite rightly, that's not something that... And we have to be careful as the more of these things appear, dash cams appear everywhere. You are collecting uh, video and imagery of people in public without their consent, often without their knowledge. And it, there is an impact to that. Um, you could go down the, the path that, uh, uh, that I've tried, which is uh, my personal service company for the contracting I do, is now registered with the ICO. <laughs> and I, I'm now um, registered under the GDPR, and you can re um, uh, ask for your right to be forgotten. And I erase all of you from my CCTV. I've yet to have anyone do it, so I don't really know what it's going to be like in, uh, in the real world. Uh, but also, I don't, my uh, front door doesn't overlap anyone else either. Just be aware that as you start to put these things up, you might be infringing on other people's liberties, and there are laws to prevent that, and they can be costly. Uh, £100,000 was only because he was very obstinate, and it dragged it out over two years, and when she asked nicely, he didn't say, oh, really, sorry, I didn't mean to upset you. <laughs> of course I'll do that. So don't worry too much. Also, watch out for local versus cloud. Your, uh, do you need remote access to your doorbell? I mean, there's no point in having your DVR sat inside of your um, uh, house if you're trying to use it to let someone in remotely and you can't see them because you're not on your network. Do you really want to be setting up a VPN? So things like Ring make that trivia simple. But then once if their cloud goes down, as it has in the past? Once if they, uh, you don't want to pay their subscription anymore and you lose access? Is that really what you want? There are trade-offs in both directions. Also, watch out for what, do you want this to be trapped inside of Ring? Or do you want to say, for example, get your CCTV system detecting motion and then triggering an alarm? Or do you want it to do number plate recognition and open the garage? Do you want it, the doorbell to be able to open the door so that you can let someone in? There's, they don't integrate as easy as you expect, so load that into your expectations. So uh, when you're doing doors and locks, watch out for these two. If it doesn't have these two, your insurer will probably be invalidated if that's your only method of in, um, ingress. So if you, you, if you replace your front door with a smart lock that doesn't have past 24, then the odds are if you got broken in, your insurer will ask and then possibly not even pay out. So uh, secure by default, SBD, is a UK police initiative. And uh, past 24 is a very common benchmark standard for doors and locks. Um, one of the things that you will notice once you start doing this is that it's very hard to work out state. Is that door open or closed? Yes. And no. <laughs> and so um, it's not binary. And most door open, garage door openers uh, go through three states. I'm opening. Oh, sorry, I'm closed. I'm opening or closing. And I'm closed. And the, you have a, a trigger of three flows through it which is, OK, I want you to open. If I now trigger it again, it will stop. So maybe it stopped here. Now, when I trigger it again, I have to now know, are you now going to open more or now start closing? And actually, that varies depending on your door opener. And so you have to be very careful about remembering the state you had. And we'll talk about cache lines and uh, things getting out of sync in a bit. Also, um, we didn't have an electric fence. Although for around about four hours, uh, this is uh, a picture from the East Midlands. We had an intense mini weather system, which blew down a number of trees, including this isn't our house, because um, it took the West Coast main line out for the whole of yesterday. There were no trains running at all across it. 
Um, it uh, took down uh, overhead power lines onto our metal fence and gate and electrified our fence for about four hours, <laughs> to which my wife rung me yesterday about, uh, new, uh, about noon, 2 p.m., going, uh, what do I do? <laughs> Aside from that, stay indoors, call the fire brigade. The, the fire brigade's uh, words were wonderful. It was, we're not touching that with a barge pole. <laughs> Uh, there were perhaps more expletives than that, <laughs> uh, but uh, luckily Western Power Distribution fixed it relatively quickly. Um, but uh, yeah, now our garage do our, our doors don't open; they'll open, but they won't close. And so, in this failure, this wasn't a failure state I had planned for. I certainly hadn't tested it. I'm not sure I would probably go off and get a high voltage wire and test it, but. It's in a state that's unacceptable because I'm nowhere to be seen. I can't run home to fix it. And my wife's like, do I just leave it with the garage open? I won't tell you the answer to that while I'm not home. <laughs> um, someone thinks I'm, I'm kind of mad for having a smart oven and hob, fridge freezer, washing machine and dryer, but they're actually really, really useful. The oven helps me cook. It tells me I want to fry some eggs or whatever. It will get it to a frying temperature and do the right thing and then turn it off. It can detect when things are wrong, when you've hit the smoke point or things. It even knows when something's on fire. Um, an induction hob can do that because it can tell the resistance difference. It's impressive. It can tell you when they're on, which is, I don't see there's a pan there, or someone was cooking, or you've been cooking for a really long time. Are you sure you're still cooking? Or, there's no lights, it's dark, and the oven's on. I wonder why that is. And you can also turn it off remotely. Uh, some of them allow you to turn it on remotely, which I think is fucking insane. I don't want to turn anything that generates heat on remotely, but turning it off is actually really powerful. Being able to say, oh, I left the hob on, and yes, I'm going to turn that off and go and investigate, especially if the fire, the fire alarm goes off and it tells me the hob's on at the same time. I'm going to make the hob not on right now. Um, fridge freezer is really useful. We had this really lonely incident of the fridge freezer her door being just left slightly ajar. So it bings, doesn't it? It's like, bing, close me, bing. 18 hours later, bing. <laughs> Uh, no one was around. Uh, we'd gone out for the day. And so, actually, it would have been useful, and it now does, to have told me that it hadn't spent 18 lonely hours going, please close me, and I could have asked a neighbor to go off and, can you shut the freezer? And it would have saved me around about 300 quid's worth of shopping that I had now defrosted, unfortunately. The washing machine and dryer, I never realized that that was a thing, but it is. They'll talk to each other. The LG one will knows what clothes you put in it and will actually tell the dryer what, uh, exactly what it needs to do to dry the clothes that it's just washed. You just literally open it and push go. It's really useful. Um, it means that you have to do less thinking, but more than that, it saves energy. Uh, not only is it air source, so it can use the, the right amount of heat that it needs, because it works out if I'm drying towels, there's no point in using the air source. I can't generate enough heat. But if I'm just doing t-shirts, yeah, absolutely, knock yourself out. It'll, also, I can say, um, uh, I'm, I'm running 20 minutes late. Can you take a bit longer so my clothes aren't sat in wet water? Uh, meter, uh, I'm really crap at judging things. Like, how long does it take to cook a chicken? And apparently cooking a chicken, only, it's not medium rare. That's not a good idea. Properly is the only way you can cook chicken. And apparently temperature is a really important thing. So meat it, you stick it in. And I actually learned some really cool things about my oven. Is that you put it on 180, it's not 180. It also isn't any number specifically. It will bounce around between 175 and 190. And sometimes it's up, sometimes it's down, almost fluctuating uh, on a gradient that I can't perceive, but I always found it really interesting just watching it bounce around. It also helps when you say, it, it's taking a really long time to cook these potatoes or whatever it is. Now you know why. Uh, I'm going to flash through the next few. We've got uh, vacuums, mops, lawnmowers. They just mean you don't have to think. You have to set them up, but then you don't think about it anymore. Uh, they're great because they just keep doing it. They're not great with stairs. They're not great with kids. Uh, well, more the other way around. Kids aren't great with them. They like to play with them. Uh, cats like to sit on them. They do love those. Uh, the ones with lasers are bad, <laughs> especially for cats. Um, 
if you've not seen Astro, so Flash to the Future, this is either the creepiest thing that is scaring the shit out of me, <laughs> or it's the most amazing thing ever. So it's basically an echo show that follows you around. It's, uh, if you want to take uh, uh, something between places, it's got a little bo uh, bucket in the back of it. It can join the ring security system, so if it hears a smash glass, or it hears someone open a door and it thinks no one's up, it'll go off and investigate. It does also know who is where, so you can tell it, hey, go find Samantha. And it'll go off and do facial recognition to go off and find Samantha, which is either great or terrible. <laughs> And so um, it can also uh, detect a human in distress. So if it sees someone lying on the floor, like an old person who's had a, a fall, it can communicate with them. It can potentially call for help. It can offer even to video dial someone in so that they can make an assessment themselves. If there's uh, heart rate monitors, if there's blood pressure monitors, it can take those uh, devices as well. So the potential for good is immense, but this feels like the data version of an atom bomb, that the potential for harm is massive too. And I don't know where we go with that. Uh, cat flap, in case you weren't aware, that's what that is. Um, the cats are, uh, are soon going to legally be required to be microchipped. And so you can, your cat will be able to let itself in and out of your house. Uh, this is the most unimpressed cat I have ever seen. And I have never seen an unimpressed cat when offered food. But if we can get over the fact that it's not a human feeding it, then I think uh, this is a great way to go away for the weekend and not worry if, uh, if my moggy is starving. Uh, we have a monitor monitor. <laughs> it's not actually a monitor, it's a bearded dragon. And uh, my kids aren't really into fluffy things. They like spiky, sharpy things and uh, danger noodles, uh, snakes. Um, so we need, have sensors in the te uh, to control the temperature. It'll vary the heat map. It'll work out is the UV lamp supposed to be on based on the night time of day. It can even tell how much water is left in the bowl based on the humidity and based on all the heat that's in it. It's quite cool. It was funky. I don't think any, it was worth the amount of effort, but it was fun doing. And if you've got younger kids, the, it's, uh, the logic involved is quite simple, accessible, and was good fun explaining how we do it. Yeah, I came across a chicken coop that was automated. I still am not sure why. I mean, you can't get the egg. I don't, I don't know, but we have automated chicken coops. A friend of mine called Tom Gidden, um, he um, has a bad back, like a really bad back, like eight of his spinal vertebrae are fused bad back. So he spends a lot of his time in chronic, chronic pain. And so he built this so that he could learn about his environment. So he'd wake up and he's in pain. It turns out actually the bioactive pressure in the environment around him can cause him to be in more or less pain. And also, the amount of oral morphine that he's got in his blood system can sometimes make him feel woozy. And it's not always one thing. But what he's got is a, a, a number of these screens around the house that if he just stands up and he's like, oh, I'm not feeling good, he can just glance at it and go, ah, <laughs> the pressure's dropped in the last five minutes. That's what it is. Or he can look and go, actually, it's been five hours and 45 minutes since I last took my drugs. I'll, I won't die if I take some more, which is always good. Uh, he got bored and tried to then work out. He's got a rough estimation that 0, 0.0 is how much oromorph he's estimated to now be left in his bloodstream. And it slowly drips down. And so it explains to him why is he feeling pain and what can he do about it at a glance. Uh, the buttons on the right are actually just a keyboard um, mount, um, number pad, a wireless keypad number pad that has ju just replaced the icons on it to give feedback. Uh, if you care about this sort of stuff, he's used Pi's, Arduinos, other PCBs using MQTT from those wireless keypads through Node Red to do message handling, and it was all coded in Pi game because it was easier to make it like a gaming system than anything else. So we've got all these things that are all over the place. We need to bring them together, because they're all si siloed. And, guess, and this is where you don't want to just rush out and buy things, because you're almost certainly going to end up in a siloed structure that you can't integrate to do what you want later. The most usual way of uh, first integration that lots of things do is a voice assistant. 
Uh, setting them all up is a pain, as in you usually set up one. You'll pick, oh, I'm Alexa, or I'm Siri, or I'm Google Home. Uh, I've got Alexa and Siri set up, but only because I'm forced to. Everything is rooted through Alexa, but I, have to, uh, I can't use Alexa and shout at Alexa on my iPhone while I'm driving saying, open the garage. So I have to create a Siri shortcut that talks to if this and that, that talks to Alexa. That talk <laughs> it's crazy. So, and also, phraseology is bloody specific. Is it open the gate or go open the gates? Or is it close the gates or trigger the gates or toggle the gates or shut the gates? I can't remember. And most of these systems will require you to either do a lot of programming to work out which category of words you're talking about, or what most happen, if, if this and that. You have to say Alexa, trigger, and then the exact phrase that you say. So if I want to open and close the garage, even though it's actually the same signal I send, I have to have two separate set, uh, setups to do the same thing. It's, it's frustrating. Uh, they are, however, very useful for people visiting that are used to them. My dad is uh, not a technophobe. He, he really likes... I mean, he had uh, a yuppie car phone in the 80s. Um, so he likes technology, but he's not good at keeping up with technology and interacting with it. But he was able to go into my kitchen and turn the radio on just by talking to Alexa because he had an Alexa Echo at home and it, the same thing worked. However, he couldn't turn the lights on. Uh, voice assistants are the most obvious integration. Uh, if you want to go off and build something, this is just a holder slide, we're not going into detail, but the Alexa Skills Kit makes it both incredibly simple and stupidly frustratingly hard to go off and do anything useful. If this and that is rather stunted, you'll say, Alexa, trigger whatever you configure, and uh, it'll run. Uh, voice assistants are helpful, but Trying to get anyone outside of the house to use it is quite tough, because what am I going to do? Hand them a manual on the way in? Here's how you talk to my house. Confusing at best. Sorry, I should have done this before. So, um, the alternative, you can pick a portal. So, Open Hab, Home Assistant, Domotus, uh, GDM. There's also Home Genie, which doesn't have a easily capturable logo. Instead, they created a font, and uh, there was no way for me to easily screenshot it. But Home, Home Genie is another interesting one. There's demos, and I actually ran multiple for a while, and I suggest you do too. Figure out which one actually works for you. The thing I found most frustrating is they all do well for different audiences. Whoever built them obviously built the model around their needs, and they were all slightly different. I could tell that these people worked in a home of multiple occupancy. I could tell that these people worked in a rural location. You're in a blinking hotel. <laughs> You're built for scale. But no, it's not obvious from using them, and it's obvious until you use them. So here's what uh, I picked. I went for Home Assistant. Looks quite pretty, has a mobile app, and is extremely extensible. Uh, I've been extending it to my needs for some time, notably plugging in things like Lightwave. Uh, I think it's going to take me another six months for this actually to get finished. I've been doing this for six months since I moved in. So it's no small undertaking, but I can see what it's going to do for me. It's going to open up and tell me what's going on. And that's really what I want. Um, all of uh, uh, the MQTT is what most of your IoT devices will be talking, so sending sensor data in talking to Node Red, and that will aggregate data and push it into uh, Grafana. Node Red will look something like this. So these are all the flows taking Gid's, uh, Tom Giddens um, um, sensor data and pushing them out so that he can consume it in uh, Grafana and ultimately display that on his clock. This is what this looks like in the middle. So from here, you can work out the changes in air and indoor air quality, humidity, and temperature. And this is what mine looks like. So why is my uh, radiator on? Uh, sorry, why is my uh, heating on? You can see in gray below the 19, 18, 18 at the top, where it says heating. They're all heating. And the only thing that doesn't need heat at the moment is the master bathroom, bathroom shower. So I can work out that most of the house is pretty cool and trying to come to temperature. I can tell that the hobby room is the most out of whack right now. 
Also, I can pick on something, say the office, and I can see that uh, the orange bits at the bottom are when I was actually spending money. And I can see the pattern, because obviously you heat a radiator and the room will keep warming, even though you stopped giving it heat. So, once I'd done all this, I learned all this, the smooth sailing, right? Uh, no. Uh, out of the box, if you don't hit what the people who are building there mean to provide to you, it's actually sometimes easier to change what you want to fit what they sold you than it is to try and make it work. My nephews managed to make every light in my house have a strobe effect. I've turned them all to LEDs. And I spoke to the tech support team and says, no, it can't do strobing. It doesn't have that feature. It's like, I don't know. It does now. <laughs> the, so um, if you are using the system as intended, it's all fine. And you're going to need to be a polyglot. Pretty much every system I have picked up are all isolated and using a different language. I've got hubs of hubs of hubs, and I had to work hard to reduce that. For, you've got different, some systems that have got a language that have written the system in. There's a language for everything that has got the extensions and a language for all of the integrations for the external parties. So dig a bit deeper and make sure you know what you're getting into. And you're now going to be rebooting your house. You're going to need to know how do you turn a light switch off? I don't mean the bulb. The light switch, how do you stop powering that light switch? You're going to need to know the wiring of your house. Firmware can be hit and miss. And be very, I'm very nervous whenever I do firmware updates, just in case there's a power outage. And I can no longer run any of my light switches. I dropped you know me and Samsung SmartThings because they forced an upgrade on me. Even though they gave me six months notice, I wasn't willing to put all the time and effort into rewrite all my scripts. But it's a cloud provider. They can do what they want. They could stop it if they wanted to. It's a very real possibility. Someone outside of your house could brick your house. <laughs> and so was it worth it? It was and still is expensive. I'm not done yet, both in my money and my time. But it's been really, really rewarding. Even though all of the maintenance and monitoring is fun and gives me something to talk about. So the future, I need to be careful about how I'm going to sell my house. Do I hand over my laptop? <laughs> do I leave my servers behind? What's going do I leave my Wi-Fi network? Have you ever tried to change the password on your Wi-Fi network and update everything to use it? It's, so I actually have an email address for my house now. <laughs> Seriously, create an email address for your house and sign up as that is the primary user, and I will hand that over when I sell my house. Consider how much your tech support you need, and one's if you're on a plane, and ensure graceful degradation. So if you, um, it can't run, if the internet goes out, if your hub stops working, if your firmware gets bricked, what do you do? How do you fall back? And think like your mother-in-law, um, stereotypically. When I come into a room, does it do what I need this room to do for me? And if not, how do I make it so that it's as intuitive as possible? These are to keep a watch on. I won't go into too much depth. Um, notably, Matter is a consortium um, of people. They used to be called the Connected Home Over IP uh, Standard. They're done by the CSA, who used to be the Zigbee Alliance. And uh, their first protocol that they're running is called Thread. And so you hear about Z-Wave, Zigbee. Thread is going to ultimately replace all of these and make everything work beautifully, because that's what standards do. But So keep an eye on that. Uh, I'll explain how in a second. I think these are going to head closer towards interoperability, consistency, security, privacy, and better abstraction and aggregation, because these are the four key pain points that come up constantly. So if you have concerns in any of these areas, dig deep into the bits of tech that you're buying to see how they view their future here. Interoperability is uh, better integration between things. So I should just be able to buy a door opener and a doorbell. And they should be able to talk to each other, and it just opens. Not because they decided to work together, but because they just do. I think more of that will come. Uh, same with consistency. There should be a consistent way of extending these platforms. Plug a bit plugging. I should be able to move between the hubs without having to get locked in by a vendor. Security and privacy, we touched on earlier. 
but realize that you're collecting data and that comes with responsibilities as well as power. Uh, better abstraction and aggregation because we have to get things to be easier. I mean, I don't mind a hard learning curve. I quite enjoy it. In fact, the challenge is something I strive for. But you're not going to get mass adoption, nor is the world going to change while it's this hard to do things that are demonstrably relatively easy in the dumb world. Finally, have a look at Stacy. Stacy Higginbotham does Stacy on IoT. Uh, more and more, I've been aligning with her view of uh, the future. She does a wonderful blog and sends out an email review of this week in IoT. And more and more, I'm becoming less relevant with these sorts of talks because she's doing it a massively wonderful job about stuff. She's talking uh, a lot about matter and thread. And if you have any vague interest, I suggest subscribing to her blog. So things I didn't talk about. You will get and you will need to build your own sensors and controllers. Uh, so you have to get into microelectronics because you're going to come across a thing you want to know that you can't find out buying a thing. For me, it was that what pipes are my, temp my boiler is work shy because it keeps staying on. And every so often it just goes, yeah, I'm not going to do that. So my radiators are, uh, are, are having cold water pumped around them and it gets to a point where the air is warmer than the radiators. So my room is heating my central heating system because that's how he exchanges. What the hell? Why? <laughs> and all, all because it's just that straight power. I open the valve, I turn on the pump, I go off and tell my heat source. If my heat source doesn't run, I don't know. So now I need to work out how often does my boiler get told to heat the room and doesn't. So I need a sensor. So I'm going to spend this weekend, actually, building sensors. Uh, TVs, music, media, throwing it around, getting Netflix, the right Netflix account. I, oh, I have a Spotify account for the house because I made the mistake of having a Spotify account that was logged into all the Alexas. And when you have various people who like love songs all the time, and my, my Spotify uh, accuracy for predicting what I like is near zero because everyone plays through my account. So now the house has an account, so watch out for that. And there is so much more, I just don't have time. And I have run over time, and I can't even do Q&A. But thank you to the people who lent me images, and thank you for listening and sticking around. Okay. <laughs>